This game is the franchise. Oh, what a shot! I don't believe it! Steve Franchise. He has a name that says the weight is on his shoulder. In the beginning, those shoulders could barely lift the ball to the rim. He was very athletic, but he was very tiny. And he would always say, am I getting bigger now? Am I getting bigger? His body grew. <laughs> and so did his reputation. A local legend, you know, he's one of those guys you hear about on the playground. He owned the gym. He stirred everybody up in there. Then tragedy derailed his promising career. There's not a day that go by that I don't that I don't think about that. And you can see him shutting down. We couldn't do a whole lot for him. He completely stopped playing basketball at all. I mean, it just wasn't there anymore. I said, what are we gonna do now, Jeff? God will take care of us. <laughs> Slowly he healed, and the passion returned. It sort of became apparent that that dream was just put on hold, that he's picking it back up now. All of a sudden he started really seeing how good he could be. Oh, what an athletic play by Steve Francis. The legend of Steve Francis just took off from there. You want excitement? This is Steve Francis. You got it. Wow. Beyond the glory. Absolutely outstanding. The Vancouver Grizzlies collect Steve Francis. He introduced himself with a whine. The Maryland guard looked like he might trip over his bottom lip. What you saw draft night was a disappointed person. You know, I was going to be so far from my family, from my grandma. He's not a phony. You may love him or not love him, but he's going to be himself. Steve, what happened there at They're the end of the half? Him, man, that's all I'm saying. That's uncalled for. It's a motion that stokes his fire. And emotion that lands him in hot water. Hanging on the rim, extra long. He leads the NBA in technical fouls. Francis fouled him, and it's a flagrant foul. Oh, now they are really yakking, James. Look at him. Now Francis took a swing. A stiff off. It's unbelievable. At a very young age, he wouldn't back down from nobody. Uh, he was he was sure about his game. Tacoma Park. There was so, uh, so much stuff that you can do. We had people uh, who really cared for, you know, the kids growing up, knowing that a lot of the kids living there uh, had single parents. Because even though we loved it, the conditions wasn't always right. You know, being on food stamps, a lot of us on food stamps and stuff growing up like that. You get in trouble. If you, if you hung out with the wrong crowd, you definitely could. My mother used to watch out the window all the time. We had to make sure that he was in the house at a certain time. You know, my mother didn't play that, especially with him because he was the youngest. My original father, he, he left um, my mom when I was like two years old. But he made decisions in his life that, hey, he needed to move on. And, you know, we, we just, you know, dealt with it. My father would come around every so often. But, you know, things just got kind of tough and tight. And, you know, it was, I guess it was time for him to leave. My mom, man, that's... Um, you know, there's so much that I can talk about. I can remember at times when we lived on Maple Avenue in Tacoma Park. We had like 14 people staying in a three-bedroom apartment. Some of my friends are, are getting to it with their parents, and... You know, 12 at night, they'll come knocking on the door. I open the door, let my mother know they're there. 
She'll let him in. Tomorrow, she'll have one on one with him. When Steve wasn't at home, he could usually be found at the local basketball courts. He was always dribbling, doing the tricks between the leagues. You no, know, really could handle the basketball very well at a very young age. I did it so much, man, that I used to get kicked out of stores. I used to go in the, the, the local sub shop, you know, bouncing the basketball, throwing the basketball off the wall. He was very athletic, but he was very tiny. And so he couldn't get the basketball to the rim from a long distance. I used to mark my height every day. I used to come in the bathroom in the morning when I got up. And, um, you know, you try to check your height. So there's a wall behind me right in the bathroom. So I'm marking my height. So for like four months, it didn't move. So I'm telling my grandma, I'm like, I'm, I ask her every day, I'm like, am I going to grow? Am I going to grow? I never thought that I would pass like 4'11". He wanted to be taller. He wanted to be taller. This was just like, I can't stand being this short. You know, I, gotta, I, gotta, I wanna grow, I wanna grow. But Steve never let his size dictate his style of play. He was able to take a hit, make a pass, score, whatever. I mean, he had no problems getting in there. Yeah, he would definitely take it to the hole. He wasn't scared. I mean, he wasn't scared at all. And we was playing like with the 18 and older, and they didn't have no mercy on him because he was small or young. You know, it's a good thing they had the mats behind the backboard because he he was going to hit them. I seen him as a little kid, actually, um, when I used to speak at the basketball camps uh, when I was in college. And I see these kids playing, and then I see this little waterhead kid off, off to the side just shooting. Layups, reverses, dribbling. When it was his turn to go in, he'd go in the game, play. After he would finish, he'd come back on the sidelines and just work on his game instead of being like everybody else who was sitting on the sideline watching the game. We were at one of the gyms in Maryland, and we only had four players. We were sitting on the sideline, and he was like, let me play, let me play. And I was like, nah, man, he's too small. Nah, man, you know. And he was begging me let him play, let him play. I mean, he drilled me right away. I mean, he was running up and down the court. I wasn't even playing as much. I was too busy watching him. The thing that he possessed that I saw that a lot of people didn't have was he played ball from his soul. It was like it was something inside of him. Steve was a star at Tacoma Park Middle School, but success didn't come so easily at Blair High. I thought I was the big man on campus. You know, he's little Stevie. He's, he's going to be the next star to come out of Blair High School. And then when I got there, you know, coming from middle school to high school, the whole atmosphere just changed. You know, you see so much going on in high school. You know, you see guys skipping school, going to hang out, uh, drinking and smoking and doing things like that. I guess the excitement of being in high school and being around the older guys, which is natural, he lost focus for a second. Yeah, normally people have like a senior skip. We had a skip party like once a week. We had to do a lot of chasing around and, and um, finding out where he was and some other students. I didn't play. I didn't play basketball until my sophomore year. I didn't have the grades. Sophomore year, I'm third point guard on the list behind a guy who I think I'm better than. And uh, me and my boy Jason Mascara, he, he was in front of me. Playing time and, and uh, was pretty, pretty slim in terms of trying to get everyone in. My sophomore year, actually, I got kicked off the team. I got suspended, and then uh, they kicked me off the team. I was so upset because, you know, I had dreams of being a basketball player, playing high school. I had dreams of, you know, taking my team to the state championship, and, you know, I, I, I didn't get a chance to play. Just a sophomore, Steve would never play another game of high school basketball. He just got the word that he won't be allowed to play. And I'm like, man, all the talent that I have, all the hours that I put in, you know, and I'm out here, excuse me. But a shocking loss would take the heaviest toll. Night that he found out, then he just, he just, he just bur bursting into tears. He said, Jeff, what are we going to do now? And I said, Steve, God, going to take care of us. so 
excited to be in that dunk contest. I ain't even trash before the dunk contest. I was just all pure adrenaline. Oh, that was awesome. I gotta give him the 10 on that one, ladies and gentlemen. Just came out, you know, dunking ball. Steve Francis is one of the premier dunkers in the NBA. But midway through high school, it appeared that he may never be tall enough to even touch the rim. Then he had the growth spurt he'd been dreaming of. He was like 5'4", five, 5'6", five, and then just came back and he was like 6 feet or something, you know, over like two weeks or so. You know, it was like, where the hell is he getting this from, you know? <laughs> and we was all out there playing around and he just picked up the ball and, I mean, dunked it. Really dunked it. And uh, everybody was like, gathering around, was like, boy, dog it like that. But Steve's highlights were all on the playground. Kicked off his high school team after his sophomore year, he transferred schools, but couldn't return to the court. Well, my junior year, I went to Kennedy because we moved from Tacoma Park out to the boondocks. The rules prohibited me from playing the first semester. Montgomery County schools wouldn't allow you to transfer and play ball, so it was real hard for him at the time. You know, the second semester, my grades went down again and I wasn't able to play. It was tough, man. Just knowing, looking at the competition, looking at the guys that I played Little League with, and they're out there, you know, they're all met, they're all counting. I'm like, damn, man, I'm, I, I think I'm better than these guys. Steve transferred back to Blair, but county rules and poor grades, again, kept him off the court. Uh, we just got the word that, hey, he can come return to Blair, but he won't be allowed to play. Uh, which was another big blow for us, but certainly for him, who really needed um, to play. Steve needed direction, but his older brothers had moved out, and his mother, Brenda, had fallen ill. For maybe 10 years, she had had a hernia uh, behind her heart. You know, she lived with that. She was very fearful of surgery. Well, mom was, uh, you know, she was sick for a while. She would be in and out of the hospital. There was certain medicines that she needed. We really couldn't afford all of it that she needed. Went up there to see her. Well, her eyes were uh, kind of yellow. And I couldn't control my emotion. Because I never saw my mother not being able to do something. Never saw her like that. You know, I was home with her and she started throwing up blood a little bit. The only thing that she would tell me was to make sure that my brothers and my sister and everybody was taken care of. In March, Brenda died of cancer. She was 39. I get like 10 pages in a row for my cousin. I called her. And, um... Mm, she was crying, and... I mean, at that point, I pretty much knew. I was driving him home, and then he just he just bur bursting into tears. You no, know, he's asking me questions like, "What's wrong?" And I'm like in the front seat, but I'm like balled up. 